I had a first cousin, probably the cousin I was the closest to, die of a heroin overdose years ago. Um, and that was before it became so prevalent. There's a bear trap on the playground right now and it's called opiates. And your kid will step in it and not know that it was even there. I can't imagine that first day. He'd come to me crying, saying, Mommy, how did I get like this? I don't want to be like this anymore. And he really didn't. I never thought that I would go from living in Reservoir Hill to here. I think if, if I didn't have my kids, I would have probably ended it a long time ago. These are the faces of addiction. They are your relatives, your neighbors, and co-workers. Some who misuse opioids, others family members of those who do. Hello everyone, I'm Jason Newton, and welcome to this special edition of 11 TV Hill, State of Addiction. The numbers, they're staggering. On average, 78 people in the U.S. die every day from an opioid-related overdose. Doctors issue more than 650,000 opioid prescriptions on an average day. And prescription opioid misuse costs the U.S. $55 billion in health and social costs each and every year. And it's only getting worse. At every level, there are efforts going on to deal with what's becoming a deadly spike in misuse and overdoses with no definite end in sight. 11 News reporter Omar Menez shows us what's going on across Maryland now to face this head on from the lab to the streets. For whom the bell tolls. Delano Johnson knows. Oh, you won't see me unless you were dead. On a typical morning, he's out trying to find those struggling with addiction who've overdosed and does his best to get them to the treatment they may desperately need. Sometimes you might not even have an address, you might just have an area where the individual hang out, a description, a nickname. That's where a lot of them hang out at. Down here at this light rail stop. Johnson is part of the Opioid Overdose Survivors Prevention Program. Those who OD and end up at either University of Maryland Medical or Harbor Hospital get referred to him. People yeah. like Richard Hullett. I started out on pain pills and heroin's cheaper. But hey, you ain't even buying heroin out there anymore. Yeah, you're, you're buying fentanyl, and, and it killed me. And uh, you know, these guys that are selling it, they don't care. Statewide in 2016, through only September, the number of heroin-related deaths jumped to more than 900. Compared to the year prior, that's a 70% increase. Across the board, alcohol, cocaine, and prescription opioid deaths all up, stemming from use either in combination with heroin or the synthetic at the center of it all. Fentanyl. It killed at least 738 people in 2016. Over the same period in 2015, it didn't even crack 200. Even handling the drugs means extra precaution. At the DEA Mid-Atlantic Laboratory, heroin is increasingly making up a larger percentage of the five to 6,000 units they see a year. We tell the agents no powder is safe. It started off that we saw an increase in heroin exhibits, we saw a rise in the purity of heroin, and then we started to see fentanyl. Now, the signs in the lab are clear. Just in case, a naloxone injector sits on a nearby table for the drug that can be absorbed even through the skin. The option to just turn our heads and say it's too big is not an option. Clay Stamp directs the state's Opioid Operation Coordination Center in the midst of Governor Larry Hogan's state of emergency, which one might typically associate with a flood or hurricane. No different, really, other than the fact that we're, we're trying to address a more chronic situation that needs an acute jump start. It means getting critical messaging out that can be implemented by local jurisdictions. And unlike a hurricane that may pass, this storm is ongoing. No definite end in sight. It's not in a neat package and there are things we know and there's a lot of things we don't know. Among what we don't know, a perfect long-term solution. But what we do know is there are differences being made. There's no amount of money that can compare to that type of reward when you see somebody just starting to live again. When you see that somebody starting to participate in their own lives again and they're smiling again. One day I'd like to go to college. I'm 48, you know? I mean, how much longer am I gonna last out there? I don't think that long. And 
I don't know a lot of old junkies. So with that in mind, Johnson drives to the next person brought back from the dead, hoping to keep them on this side of mortality. Omar Jimenez, WBAL TV 11 News. Addiction knows no zip code, no ethnicity, no economic class. Its grip is firm and getting freed from it is a long-term proposition. I-Team lead investigative reporter Jane Miller shows us the toll it takes from the city to the suburbs. So at the end, um, I was living in here. Phaedra is 53 years old. One day last month, she took us on a tour of where she'd been living until January, addicted to drugs. And I ended up living here and I ended up eating out the trash. I ended up sleeping with rats. There's rats in here, as you can see. Um, my clothes that I wore probably are still in there. You know, it's no clean water, no running water. So a lot of days I didn't get to take a bath. You know, um, I had to go other places in restaurants um, or use people's backyards to wash up. And you were just squatting, am I right? I was a squatter, a squatter, yes. And this was the condition when you lived in it? Yes. God bless. The ceiling's coming down. There's yes. No so when it rains, it rains inside of here too. Careful where you step. Needles, discarded food, dog waste. Hard to imagine this is your life. Addiction caused Phaedra, her house, her job, her car. Okay. This trash is food. It's the, it's, you know, when you finish eating. But there's like dog feces with it. Well, everything goes on in this backyard. I mean, you're, it's an abandoned house. And a lot of times, this is where I went to the bathroom, back here. But just in this backyard? Well, all the way back here. Out in that corner? Yeah, in that corner. That's how I lived. I know, you can't imagine it, can you? I know that addiction is a powerful phenomenon. Yes. And takes away just about all of your common sense. Yes. And self-respect. Troy is 46. He lives in Hartford County. Each morning, he gets picked up from transitional housing and taken to a methadone clinic. I wasn't on methadone. I don't know where I'd be. What I, I know that I'd be on something, you know, and that's for sure. Hi, hi. We first met Troy and his wife Brandy in 1999. That's when they started methadone treatment, trying to overcome addiction to heroin. That was long before opioid addiction became such a big story in the suburbs. Brandy in an interview in March of that year. I want my family back. I want a real life. I want to start living. We saw Troy and Brandy again in 2004. They remained on methadone, but life was hard. Each had criminal records from stealing to pay for their addiction. Their past right. was not well, easily left behind. Weekend. I really, truly expected, you know, to get everything back like that and have everything be perfect, which, you know, is a, the grand illusion. It's life on life's terms, and that's what we're living now. Today, Troy has a job. He's devoted to his two children. Brandy is gone. She died in November of 2014, overdosed on drugs. The night that she passed away, uh, I mean, I, something told me to wake up and I, I had woken up and she was in a weird position next to me. And um, I knew something was wrong right away. I felt there no pause and she was still warm. So I pulled her straight out, you know, and, and started CPR while my daughter called 911. She, um, she couldn't say no to it. She, she just couldn't say no to the drugs. I mean, she fell, she fell into that category of the people that never wanted to stop. If I'm not mistaken, I think I was holding on right about here. An overdose nearly killed Phaedra in December. She collapsed on a West Baltimore playground. I sniffed it and all I remember saying, you know, I remember the person asking me, you know, how is it? And I remember saying, it's good. You know, I didn't get to get the D out. I just got G and one O out. And the next thing I know, uh, a young lady that works here at Penn North, thank God for her, uh, she watched me go out. She watched me OD, and thank God she called the ambulance. And I was told 
that I had to have three nanoxanol shots. That's the thing about heroin and opioids, users say. You get to looking for a better high. You're looking for the nod, you're looking for the high. And the greater the nod, the greater the high. And my dope wasn't good unless I threw up. You know, that's how I knew my dope was good. And you get a warm sensation that runs through your body. And it makes you feel like, you know, the only way I can describe it, it made me feel like Supergirl. You know, like Even I- it makes you sick. Yes, yes. Because after you throw up, then here comes this wonderful high. In January, Phaedra made a decision. And I remember my last day using in here. And, you know, I was smoking crack and I looked at the stem, you know, and I said, is this really how you feel about yourself, Phaedra? I remember asking myself that question, is this really how you feel? And, you know, I made a decision. We have a lot of positive affirmations around. Phaedra is now learning what Troy has known for more than 15 years. Overcoming opioid addiction is a long-term commitment. It's not just you get admitted, you maybe go to a 30-day rehab and you're cured. No, that's not the case. You get admitted, we start you on treatment. It can be drug-free. Right now I'm recommending buprenorphine or methadone as long-term maintenance, um, but you need to be on it long-term. And even if you come off of that, you're gonna face struggles and you need to have in your network people that know that you have a problem and so you can actually prevent uh, a relapse from occurring. I'm a slave to it. And I some, if I honestly didn't have my kids, I would think that, I don't know, I, I, I mean, it's not what I want to say really, but I, I feel sometimes like there's no out, you know, there's just no out. I was trying to fit in. Phaedra has been clean for about four months. She's volunteering in a community center. That vacant house where she stayed while using drugs, right around the corner from where she goes for treatment. But most importantly, what's next is to stay clean for the next five minutes. I'm Jane Miller, WBAL TV 11 News. Still ahead on this special edition of 11 TV Hill, State of Addiction. We're joined by a panel of experts to talk about the opioid problem, how we got where we are, and the best steps moving forward. But first... I didn't understand narcotics, uh, specifically opiates. I thought it was a little bit stronger than an aspirin. A wife and mother's worst fear, her husband and son misusing opioids. How this Maryland woman turned to activism and is now helping others like her. Do you or someone you know need help with addiction? Call our hotline. We have volunteers ready to take your call. That number is 410-261-2300.